Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 Elaine moments on Seinfeld. You know, I don't really think that this is appropriate right now. For this list, we're looking at the sitcom's funniest and most memorable quotes, scenes, and storylines featuring Julia Louis-Dreyfus's character Elaine Bennis. When did Elaine crack you up and when did she make you cringe? Let us know in the comments below. Number 20. Wearing an Orioles cap at a Yankees game Elaine has a stubborn streak, and this quality gets her into trouble in this third season episode. What a great day. I could have been in my boss's son's bris right now. <laughs> when she wants to attend a Yankees game with George, Elaine lies to get out of attending a bris for the son of her boss, Mr. Lipman. I think you better take off the Orioles cap. Yeah, I better. <laughs> no, 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 seriously, you're in the owner's box. I don't think it's a good idea. However, the plan backfires, as her refusal to remove her cap advertising the Baltimore baseball team gets her entire group thrown out. To make matters worse, she then must prevent Lipman from seeing her photo in the newspaper sports section. Can I have my sports section? <laughs> Sports section. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm saving it for the plane. I never miss the Sunday sports section. Well, you know, there's nothing to read. It's yeah. yesterday's news. Elaine doesn't quite get off scot free, and this moment encapsulates the cheeky attitude and terrible luck that make her so entertaining to watch. We're not going to show it. We don't want to encourage that kind of behavior. Hey, it's a young lady, and boy, she's really going at it with the security guard. Number 19, being mistaken for Susie. Peggy, you really saved me. That was no problem. Mr. Peterman is gonna love her. Thanks, Susie. This is one of Elaine's most downright ridiculous storylines, but also one of her funniest. Thinking that her name is Susie, Elaine's co-worker Peggy complains about her to her face. Look, I should have said this yesterday, Did you get but... this memo from Elaine Bennis? Yeah, see that? No, it's amazing Peterman hasn't fired that dolt. This spurs their boss, Jay Peterman, to organize a meeting with both Elaine and Susie present. Elaine often shoots herself in the foot, and her refusal to simply correct Peggy's error spins hilariously out of control. Think that at its core, this is a Susie and Elaine problem that requires a Susie and Elaine solution. Her subsequent tale about Susie's death leads to a funeral for the fictional employee that she herself must attend. What can you say about a girl like Susie? It's a classic case of mistaken identity, but her desperate attempts to keep her lie going lead to some truly unique situations. But the best moment of all has to be when Elaine bizarrely takes ownership of her new name. She was a disaster, Suze. Look it. It's not Suze, all right? It's Susie. <laughs> Number 18, taking over Jay Peterman's job. Now I want four new ideas from each of you by six o'clock. Now make that six ideas by four o'clock. All right, let's move, move, move! Elaine's relationship with her erratic boss and her status at work take an unexpected turn in season eight. While Elaine pitches a downright terrible product idea, a distracted Jay Peterman takes off to Myanmar and leaves her to run his namesake catalog. Mr. Peterman, you can't leave. I've already left, Elaine. I'm in Burma. Kramer's story of gaining confidence at his karate class inspires Elaine. So I listened to my katra. Now what? I'm dominating the dojo. Until she discovers his opponents are children. Oh, uh, well, I'm, do I'm dominating. <laughs> said you were fighting children. Well, it's uh, not the size of the opponent, Elaine. It's uh, the ferocity. Seeing Elaine transform from an anxiety-riddled cog in the machine to a way overconfident authoritarian is hilarious, mostly because we can tell that it's fleeting. You doofus! <laughs> but the most memorable part of this storyline is her ill-conceived urban sombrero that she places on the publication's cover. What is that? <laughs> The urban sombrero. <laughs> I put it on the cover. Number 17, lying about the English patient. Much like her friends, Elaine just can't help but share her opinions. God, that movie stunk. I kind of like it. No, you didn't. After seeing the romantic war drama, Elaine finds herself punished for disliking it. But to tell you the truth, Elaine, I don't know if I can be with someone who doesn't like the English patient. To stay in her boss's good graces, she claims she hasn't seen it, but gets roped into yet another screening. Elaine, what did you think? <laughs> well, uh, actually, I haven't seen it, so I couldn't tell you whether I liked it or whether it really sucked. It's truly side-splitting to see Elaine absolutely lose it in the theater and get fired for it. Elaine, you don't like the movie? I hate it! I'm going to hell! <laughs> oh, I didn't 
couldn't you say so in the first place? You're fired. Great, I'll wait for you outside. Her relationship with the eccentric Jay Peterman is one of the show's funniest, and this episode sums it up well. The fact that he'll rehire her only if she visits the film's Tunisian setting is somehow both outlandish and totally on brand. Number 16. Trying to buy socks for Mr. Pitt One of Elaine's major arcs focuses on her work life and finds her at the mercy of multiple fickle bosses. In the sixth season premiere, her attempt to channel Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis inadvertently lands her a personal assistant gig with a publishing executive. Charmed. <laughs> I was a great admirer of Mrs. Onassis. <laughs> he turns out to be a stickler, and even the task of buying him socks is an absolutely maddening affair. Elaine has sizable career ambitions, and often seems to be on the path to success. But in classic Seinfeld fashion, her breakthroughs often turn out to be setbacks, and this moment captures that painful pattern particularly well. What do you want? I want a decent sock that's comfortable that'll stay on my foot! Number 15. Jerry's Pez Dispenser Didn't you hear that person laughing? I couldn't play. I was humiliated. Well, I I'm sure it wasn't at you. Well, then what was she laughing at? Pez? Oh, no, thank you. Whether at work, at an important function, or just relaxing with her friends, Elaine's social graces aren't exactly her strong suit. This comes to the fore in this episode, in which the gang attends a performance by George's pianist girlfriend, Noelle. Jerry mischievously places one of the iconic candy dispensers on Elaine, and for some reason she finds it just hysterical. <laughs> In the midst of the emotional recital, Elaine bursts into laughter and must flee the theater. It's an incredibly cringe-worthy moment, and of course, it forces George to hide her identity from his girlfriend. I'll never forget that laugh for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure she would apologize if she could. <laughs> Probably someone is holding her back. Maybe against every fiber of her being. But almost as funny as the outburst itself is Elaine and Jerry's speculation about the culprit in Noelle's dressing room. I mean, only a sick, twisted mind could be that rude and ignorant. Well, you know, maybe some mental defective put something stupid on her leg. Number 14, trying to score the supreme flounder. China Panda. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'd like to place an order. Elaine is not unlike Kramer in going to sometimes ridiculous lengths to satisfy her desires. In this eighth season episode, she tries to circumvent a restaurant's delivery boundaries. she finally finds an empty utility closet to disguise as her apartment, and her friends eventually join her in the tiny space. Hi. Sorry, I didn't hear you. I was in the shower. I'll see ya. <laughs> Although she can get her flounder, she's also forced to keep up appearances as the building's custodian. The fact that she will stop at nothing to get her fish delivered is both wacky and not all that surprising for Elaine. And seeing her take on another job and even another home for this sole purpose makes this episode unforgettable. Number 13, her date with Phil Totola. Boy, this has been one hell of a night. Oh, I'm sorry Jerry didn't suggest this sooner. Elaine's storyline in this season five episode doesn't take up much time, but it's nothing if not memorable. Jerry decides to set her up with one of the best guys he knows, Phil Totola. The date is great, until the very end, when Phil takes things in a very inappropriate direction. Good night. Good night? Well. Although it's horrible to see Elaine endure this skeezy interaction, her debrief with Jerry is an absolutely unforgettable moment. Let's see. How shall I put this? Well, just put it. He took it out. It's not the only instance of the show skirting around lewd topics, but it is one of the funniest. He took what out? It. He took it out? Yes, sir, Bob. As if the situation weren't painful enough, 
Kramer stops by Jerry's apartment and provides a truly harebrained explanation for the unexpected flash. Well, maybe uh, it needed some air. <laughs> you know, sometimes they need air. They can't breathe in there. It's inhuman. Number 12, Yada Yada-ing. This eighth season episode is famous for taking as its focus the titular filler phrase. I'm on Third Avenue, minding my own business, and yada, 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 I get a free massage and a facial. Wow. What a succinct story. George's girlfriend, Marcy, uses the line to omit unimportant events from her stories, and at first he takes a liking to it. We were engaged to be married. Uh, we bought the wedding invitations, and... Uh, Yada, 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 I'm still single. But soon enough, he's worried that she's hiding a sexual tryst with her ex, and we don't blame him. Although she's not directly implicated in the storyline, Elaine hilariously weighs in on the topic of skipping over sex. In an episode already full of wit and wordplay, this line is one of the funniest. I've yada yada sex. Really? Yeah. I met this lawyer, we went out to dinner, I had the lobster bisque, we went back to my place, yada, 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 I never heard from him again. But Julia Louis-Dreyfus also deserves credit for her delivery of the subtle yet brutal roast. But you yada, yada over the best part. No, I mentioned the bisque. <laughs> Number 11, snapping at a party guest. We should have a signal that you're in trouble so the other one can get us out of it. How old are you? 36. <laughs> Elaine, moody, never. This beloved character doesn't always keep it together, and this is especially the case in this season three episode. George brings her and Jerry to a party on Long Island, only to later run off with the latter's car. Sadly, everyone else at the party is extremely dull, and although Elaine and Jerry devise an SOS signal for boring conversations, it doesn't help. On the other hand, you take a guy like George Washington Carver. The man devoted his whole life to the peanut. Imagine having so much passion for something. When another guest prattles on about her own fiance, Elaine becomes so agitated that she can't help but retort. Maybe the dingo ate your baby. <laughs> what? The dingo ate your baby. With a reference to an Australian tragedy from the year 1980, the line is definitely strange. But her delivery is so gleefully rude that it somehow feels like the sickest burn we've ever heard. Number 10, tossing George's toupee. Elaine's storyline in this season six episode involves disguising a coworker's sexual identity. But her funniest moment actually centers on a development in George's life. With a new hairpiece boosting his confidence, George is shocked to find that his blind date is as bald as he is. She's bald! <laughs> mean bald. What do you think I mean, bald? Bald! Bald bald! Ever our heroine, Elaine steps in to bring her friend back down to earth in the most hilarious way. You're rejecting somebody because they're bald. So? <laughs> You're bald! Julia Louis-Dreyfus plays this moment with true ferocity, and the lines she spits at George are priceless. For all of Jerry and George's unfair judgment of women, we're thankful that Elaine has her head screwed on straight. Sometimes. I don't like this thing! <laughs> and here's what I'm doing with him! <laughs> ah! Number 9, her Christmas card. Elaine is no stranger to embarrassing herself, and when she teams up with Kramer, it's practically a recipe for disaster. In this episode, Elaine takes up her friend's offer to shoot her Christmas card. In a tragic mishap, she doesn't discover that the photo reveals her nipple until after the greetings are sent. I'm not sure, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I see a nipple. Elaine experiences numerous misfortunes in the series, but seeing her experience the fallout of this gaffe is particularly tough. Everybody's calling me Nip. <laughs> yeah, that's my new nickname at the office, Nip. It's a truly iconic Elaine plotline. And to top it all off, she practically attacks George when he complains about not receiving one of the infamous cards. You want a Christmas card? You want a Christmas card? All right, here. Here's your Christmas card. <laughs> Number eight, telling Jerry she faked it. Why'd you have a fake? Of course. Really? <laughs> you fake? On occasion. And the guy never knows? No. Yeah. How can he not know that? Because I was good. As great friends as they are, Jerry and Elaine have a relationship that's sometimes haunted by their romantic past. In the fifth season premiere, George is concerned with his sexual chemistry with a girlfriend. 
to her friend's shock, Elaine reveals that she faked it while dating Jerry. I guess after that many beers, he's probably a little groggy anyway. <laughs> No. It's clear that she relishes dropping the bomb at least a little bit, and it's hilarious to watch. The admission leads to such tension between the pair that they later decide to give it another go. But thanks to Julia Louis-Dreyfus's expert delivery, the episode's highlight is undeniably their banter just after the initial confession. You faked with me? Yeah. You faked with me? Yes. No. Yes. You faked it? I faked it. That whole thing, the whole production, it was all an act. Not bad, huh? Number seven, drama in the public restroom. This woman just didn't get it. She kept harassing me. Three squares. That's all I was asking for, three squares. The characters in Seinfeld are flawed, to say the least. One of Elaine's main foibles is her sometimes vindictive nature. And this takes center stage in this season five episode. In an iconic scene, Elaine asks her restroom neighbor to spare some tissue, but the latter refuses. Three squares? You can't spare three squares? No, I don't have a square to spare. I can't spare a square. It turns out the selfish stranger is Jerry's girlfriend. And once Elaine finds out, suffice it to say, she gets her revenge. The back and forth between stalls is truly outlandish, and we only need to see the women's feet to know exactly what's going on. And with Elaine stopping at nothing to get back at her new nemesis, she completely steals the show in the episode's last moments. Wait a minute. I know you. That's right, honey. And I know you. Go! 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 Number six, hurting her back at the Seinfelds' home. Bars braced my back! If TV shows are to be believed, making the trip from New York to Florida is challenging enough on its own. But Elaine encounters additional obstacles while accompanying Jerry on a visit to his parents' place. Not only is she a sweaty mess thanks to no AC, her sleep on the Seinfeld's pull-out couch also seriously screws up her back. What's the matter? My back. What happened? Uh, that if watching Elaine's nighttime tantrum isn't funny enough, we then get to see her way too hopped up on muscle relaxants. <laughs> you took too many of those pills. This episode shows the character in extremes, from fuming in agony to giddily impersonating Marlon Brando in a streetcar named Desire. And both are pure entertainment. Stella! <laughs> Number five, her subway trip. Jerry, George, Kramer, and Elaine all get fantastic storylines in this transit-themed episode. But the latter subway ride is particularly nightmarish. First, she's chatted up by a bigoted woman who doesn't take Elaine's role as best man at a lesbian wedding kindly. There is no he. There's no he. So, uh, who's getting married? Um. Two women. Things only get worse when the train abruptly stops and Elaine is overcome by feelings of claustrophobia. I can't breathe. <laughs> I feel faint. Okay, take it easy. It'll start moving soon. It's hilarious to hear such a neurotic character's inner thoughts as she contemplates spending the rest of her life in the car. Julia Louis-Dreyfus's performance in the later part of the episode is a masterclass in body language, and it makes for both cringe-inducing and side-splitting viewing. Move! 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 It's moving! It's moving! Number four, the coach flight. Excuse me, I've got to go to the bathroom. I've got to go to the bathroom. Oh, Seinfeld satirizes the struggles of air travel in this episode. And of course, we see this experience through Elaine's eyes. I have one seat in first class and one in coach. The price is the same because your flight was canceled. Oh, well, uh... I'll take the first class. While Jerry scores a seat at the front end of the plane, Elaine's behavior towards an airport employee gets her luggage sent to Hawaii. Then she suffers through a brutal trip in the economy section thanks to an inconsiderate neighbor, a stinky bathroom, and a no-nonsense flight attendant. Help me. <laughs> Although we can understand Elaine's frustration, it is hilarious to see her get so worked up over the minutia of flying coach. You're not supposed to get up during the food service. Well, nobody told me that. Her trials and tribulations are especially funny, contrasted with Jerry's lavish first-class experience. Why, it's a perfect fit. You must be Cinderella. <laughs> 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 
Number three, confronting Yev Kassem. The guy who runs a place is a little temperamental, especially about the ordering procedure. He's secretly referred to as the soup Nazi. This isn't the only Seinfeld episode where Elaine seeks revenge, but it is certainly one of the most memorable. The gang finds a place that offers amazing soup, but enforces draconian rules. Elaine's flippant attitude gets her banned from the shop. No soup for you! Come back! One year! But thanks to Kramer, she inadvertently ends up in possession of the vendor's prized recipes. This discovery leads to one of the show's most iconic conclusions, as Elaine returns to the store and tells the soup Nazi his career is over. The venom in her voice as she recites his own catchphrase is shocking, and yet could not be funnier. No more soup for you. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, the sponge-worthy question. Just couldn't decide if he was really sponge-worthy. Elaine's storyline in this seventh season episode memorably hinges on the topic of birth control. The sponge. Sponge. Okay, the today sponge. Yeah, but wasn't that taken off the market? After Kramer informs her that her brand of contraceptive sponges is being taken off the market, she must use her stockpile wisely. This conundrum leads to multiple funny moments. She decides to completely buy out a local pharmacy and denies George access to her stash, even though his personal life with Susan Ross depends on it. Makeup sex is all that I have left. <laughs> I'm sure you'll have another fight, George. Even better, though, is her rigorous interview with boyfriend Billy about his sponge worthiness. Do you think you're sponge worthy? Yes, I think I'm sponge worthy. I think I'm very sponge worthy. Although there's nothing wrong with having high standards, it's truly amazing to see Elaine's ultra formal approach to such an intimate activity. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, dancing in public. All right, who's dancing? Come on, who's dancing? You want me, you want me to get it started? When it comes to defining moments for this Seinfeld character, simply nothing compares to her demonstrating her iconic dancing skills, or lack thereof. Elaine finds herself alienated from her colleagues after a work party, and of course, she assumes it's George's fault. But in fact, her absolutely cringe-worthy dance floor moves are to blame. Limbs flailing, arms akimbo, feet kicking up dust. What? What is so funny? To get an objective view, Elaine records herself over a bootleg film tape, but she becomes infamous after the video is distributed. Sweet fancy Moses! all of her lovable traits, this character seriously lacks self-awareness, and this plot captures that fact in a truly unique way. But I really enjoy dancing! And that's not helping either! Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.